We now return to an example, an application that we saw earlier, which is the simple mass attached to a spring attached to a wall system. Our prediction was that if this was the equilibrium position for the spring, in other words, that's where the force was zero, then we'd have oscillations around that center simply because the spring would pull when the mass is over here, would pull it towards the center, it would overshoot, and then the spring would push it, the mass back across the zero line and repeat forever. There's no friction in this model, so we'd have a conservation of energy and we'd simply have oscillations that go on for all time. Now what we'd like to do is get a prediction about the position over time. I would like to be able to freeze the frame and say, I understand how the system works, so after 5.7 seconds, exactly where is this mass going to be? Or other questions would be, how long does it take to complete a cycle? That kind of thing. Unfortunately, we do not have that information. What we've got, which is more than nothing, is Newton's second law, F equals MA. Now you'll notice there is no X in this, or certainly no X equals. We can do a little bit of conversion here, and we note that the spring force is negative KX. So there's our spring force. And it does have an x in it, that's fine, but it's not a function of time on the other side. This is just code for the second derivative of x, which is the acceleration. So this is not good enough if we wanted to make a prediction about what's going to happen when we let this go. It's, a, however, a perfectly good differential equation, and it becomes an even better differential equation from our purposes if we put it in standard form, like so. As soon as we put it in standard form, we see all sorts of nice features. This is a linear, constant coefficient. It's second order. And it has a zero on the right-hand side, so it's also homogeneous. All these ingredients are nice because we've learned how to solve exactly this kind of case, or in other words, how to work from this and get x equals position over time. So let's go ahead and do that. Find the general solution to this differential equation. We know the first step is going to be our assumption. We're going to assume x is our unknown function here, and t is the unknown variable. So we're going to assume that our solution looks something like an e to the rt, and that's going to give us the characteristic equation. which in this case here is simply r squared. There's no x primes, so there's no r, but we do have a k over m, no derivative, no r, and zero on the right-hand side. Solving for r, we get r squared is negative k over m, or r is equal to plus or minus square root of negative k over m. Well, let's factor that out. We're gonna get one of those complex root scenarios. We're going to have plus or minus root k over m times root negative 1. And if we put this in the a plus or minus b root negative 1 form, there's really a 0 out front for the a. The b is this square root of k over m, and the root negative 1 is root negative 1. And immediately, because of our experience solving these kinds of equations and interpreting what these r values mean for us, we can write x right now as some combination of cos, let's be more specific here, e to the a, so 0t times cos of b, square root of k over m, times t, plus c2, e to the 0t sine, square root of k over m, t. Now, both of these exponentials are simply one in value, because they have the zero exponent, and so we get, in the end, the quite simple prediction of cos square root of k over m times t, plus another coefficient unknown yet, of sine square root of k over m times t. And these are simple oscillations which is exactly what we'd expect if we let this mass go and let the force of the spring dictate the motion from there on in. So we get a very nice reassurance that what we're modeling in the physics and then what we're using as a solution technique to generate x equals out of the differential equation 
give some meaningful results, at least in this example here. We can take it one step further and actually get some new information that was otherwise unobtainable. Let's predict the period of the oscillations. How long does it take that mass to do one full cycle? Well, we can't learn that from the F equals MA part. That doesn't tell us anything about time and how time passes. However, our x equals c1 cos of square root of k over mt plus c2 sine tells us an awful lot about how long things take. These are m's. And depending on how familiar or practiced you are with your sines and cosines, you can re recall the period of a cosine. Let's put a bt in here because that's explicit. This b, if it's larger than 1, makes things happen faster, and so the period gets smaller, and so the period is 2 pi over that b value. And for our case, if someone told us how stiff the spring was and what the mass we're trying to oscillate is, we'd have some predictions. Bigger mass probably means slower or longer periods. Uh, bigger k probably means faster periods, faster, stiffer motion. And so for our case, the period is 2 pi over this thing, over square root of k over m. And let's flip that over. It'll look a little nicer. And we get square root of m over k times 2 pi. The natural units would be seconds here. And we can get our result here that larger masses implies longer periods. Check. That's what we'd expect and larger k, stiffer springs, well that means a larger force pulling the mass back and forth, so we expect smaller periods, faster motion, and we do see that as well. And that's something that we could only obtain from the solution and not from Newton's second law by itself. So that's one illustration of the power of being able to solve these differential equations.